In this video, we introduce quotient slash factor groups. All right, so here's the theorem. Let n be a normal subgroup of G. Then this set, which we're going to call G mod n, is a group. And if G is a finite group, then the order of this quotient group is the index of n and G, which by Lagrange's theorem is the size of G divided by the size of n. And the group operation is given by this multiplication. Given two cosets with the representative G1 and G2, the product of cosets has representative G1 times G2. So in a previous video, we showed that if you assume this operation was well-defined, then it was associated. However, we did need to check that it was well-defined. And we saw that if you assumed it was well-defined, we discovered that n had to be normal in G. Now we're going to show that if n is normal in G, then you have that this operation is well-defined. So let's prove well-defined in this. Let's assume that we have f these two cosets are equal, and these two cosets are equal. Notice I'm using little f and little g specifically because I have to use a different letter and I'm using subscripts to help me keep track of which elements go together. So uh, G1 and F1 are in the same coset and G2 and F2 are in the same coset. And so what do I want to prove? I want to prove that if I multiply this first coset by this second coset I get the same result no matter which representative I pick. In other words I want to prove that this coset, G1, G2, N, is equal to F1, F2, N. Because this is what I would get if I multiply G1, N times G2, N, according to my formula. Well, the other one is what I would get according to my formula if I multiply F1, N times F2, N. And in order for this to be a well-defined function, the resulting calculations have to be the same regardless of which coset representatives I picked, because they belong to the same cosets. So let's try to prove that. Well, since G1, since the first cosets are equal, the representatives have to satisfy this property, that G1 inverse F1 is an element in the normal subgroup. Similarly, since the second cosets are equal, there's this relationship between the second representatives. G2 inverse times F2 must be an element in N. Since N is a normal subgroup in G, I can conjugate any element in N by any element in G, in this case G sub 2, and the result is still an element in the subgroup. So if I conjugate this by G2, I end up with an element in N. Likewise, because N is a subgroup, I can multiply this ugly expression by any other element in N, and the result is in N. So I get this complicated calculation is an element in N, involving the first term is a conjugate of this thing, and the second one is the other thing. So the first term comes from our first equality of cosets and the second term comes from our second equality of cosets. However, we note that these middle two G2s actually cancel and we actually have this term, G2 inverse G1 inverse F1 F2 is an N. If you factor out that common inverse here, you have G1 G2 inverse. But this is exactly the condition you need to say that these two cosets are equal. G1, G2, N is equal to F1, F2, N, if and only if this element is an element in the subgroup. Which, working backwards, is how one would have come up with this proof. You know you need to show this equality, so you know you need to show this. And based on what we have, you just say, well, what can I do? I know these two facts, 
somehow I need to figure out a way to get G2 inverse F2 in here somewhere, so I just insert a G2 inverse G2. And then while I have this element that's an N, what's left over? Well, it's a conjugate of G1 inverse F1. And so working backwards, you could see how I came up with the proof. But either way, we now see that when N is a normal subgroup in G, this multiplication on quotient on the quotient group is in fact well defined. So this is another way to state the definition of being normal. A subgroup is normal if and only if this operation on cosets is well defined. Of course, in order to be a group, you also need to have an identity. One of the things that really trips students up when working with quotient groups, actually the main thing that trips people up working with quotient groups or factor groups is that the elements we have to remind ourselves are cosets. That means the elements are sets. So the identity element is going to be a set. In fact, it's a coset. Which coset is it? It's the coset co corresponding to the subgroup itself. Because remember, the subgroup itself is a coset. If you're using that analogy with parallel lines, this makes sense. This is the line, parallel line that goes through the origin. So it's usually the, the line that goes through the origin is going to be the nice one. And you can check n times gn. Well, the, the reason why this is the identity coset is because this is the coset where you can choose E as the coset representative. It's the only coset that has E as an element in it. By definition of our multiplication, EN times GN is EGN. Since E is the identity in G, E times G is GN. And so we see we have the property we want. And you'll see this in other calculations whenever you work with quotient groups and theorems later is that we'll do proofs and you'll discover that, well, we want the identity to be a subgroup. And this usually gets confusing. The reason why is because the identity element in a quotient is in fact a set. Likewise, we have to deal with inverses. The inverse of the coset is a coset whose representative is the inverse of any representative of the original coset you started with. That's not too surprising because the calculation shows it. If you multiply these two cosets, that the result is given by multiplying any of their representatives. And g inverse g is the identity.